والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحابه ومن استنى بسنتي إلى يوم الدين Our praise is due to Allah May Allah's peace and blessings be on the last Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day The topic for this evening's first lecture is on the transmission of hadith the transmission of hadith in our previous two sessions we looked first at the definitions concerning hadith uh, what it was in the language and how it was used in the Quran and in the uh, statements of Prophet according to its linguistic meaning then we looked at <coughs> what the meaning had become and we compared it uh, to the sunnah and we looked at the importance of hadith in Islam right? uh, as a vehicle for conveying the sunnah to us referred to as the storehouse of the sunnah and also uh, for the fact that the sunnah itself uh, played a particular role in terms of explaining uh, the Quran it was the second source of revelation and it, the, the Prophet Muhammad himself was um, the moral example uh, to the Ummah etc etc <clears throat> then we uh, looked at the um, uh, what was the second thing that we looked at after that I'm supposed to be testing you anyway <laughs> yeah the, the compilation of the hadith, right? We began in the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallam, what took place during his lifetime, um, what he conveyed. We looked at certain issues where uh, people have taken the concept that uh, nothing of the sunnah was written down, nothing of the hadiths were written down during the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad Sallam because of the fact that there is an authentic hadith found in uh, Sahih Muslim uh, from Abu Sa'id al-Khudri in which he said that the Prophet Sallallahu had said that you should not write anything uh, besides the Qur'an and if anyone writes anything besides the Qur'an it should be erased and we dealt with that issue that this was actually in reference to writing things along with the Qur'an not besides the Qur'an in the sense of anything else other than the Qur'an but along with the Qur'anic text when people were involved in recording the Qur'anic text to avoid interpolation or the addition of some of the statements of Prophet Muhammad to the Quranic text themselves and uh, from there we looked at a, a variety of different narrations in which Prophet Muhammad did instruct his companions to record material where people requested it and he okayed it you know write uktubu li abi shah you know write for abu shah who requested him to write uh, the, the sermon which he had given uh, after the conquest of Mecca and so on and so forth a number of different hadiths we, we looked at uh, where the companions were involved in writing you know some said they used to write down everything Prophet Muhammad used to say and the Prophet uh, gave his seal of approval to their actions and we spoke about the fact that the majority of the leading companions who narrated uh, hadith, large numbers of hadith, the majority of them wrote their hadith down. And the majority of the leading uh, narrators from the Sahaba, their students in turn, uh, the majority of them also wrote down hadith. So that's the second generation, are known as the Tabi'un, uh, they were also known to have written down hadith and their students, the tabi'un, tabi'in, the students of the successors, they were all uh, known well to record the uh, hadith. In fact, they, uh, there was even um, uh, the, the major compilation of the hadith took place in their time. We said this was when uh, <coughs> Omar ibn Abdul Aziz the fifth righteous caliph, he instructed Az-Zuhri and other scholars of his time to compile 
the, uh, the hadith which are already being written. They are being written by a number of scholars. He instructed that they be compiled into uh, text. And in fact, he gave special um, mention to uh, Zuhri, he gave special mention to him to collect the hadith of Amra, uh, who was the female, who was uh, the main narrator of the hadith from uh, Aisha. And, you know, she, of course, her fiqh, played a major role in the development of Islamic law that we know today. And um, we said that the, the writing of the hadith did go through different phases, the first one being the Sahih phase, then it went into the Musannaf, and the Musnad, and finally the Sahih. And we discussed the different uh, <coughs> levels in which they uh, passed through. But the main point that we stressed from all of that was that in fact the Sunnah, the Hadith, were written, the vast majority of the Hadith of Prophet were written down in his own lifetime. Which is contrary to the commonly understood view that most of the writing took place in the time of Az-Zuhri, which was in the second century. Right? And we pointed out in any case, even if it was that the writing did begin in the time of Az-Zuhri, which in fact it didn't. The time lapse between the death of Prophet Muhammad and the writing of his hadith was still a very short period because those who were doing the writing were already contemporaries of the students of the Sahaba. You know, so there was only a step, a very short step uh, to the Sahaba, to Prophet Muhammad uh, through which they recorded the hadith. Anyway, in this uh, session, we'll be looking at the methods which developed amongst those who were involved in teaching and learning the hadiths of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And the general uh, heading which is given to this process of, of learning the hadith is called Tahammul Al-Ilm. Tahammulul ilm, which means literally carrying knowledge. What they're referring to really are the methods by which the knowledge was conveyed. And <coughs> a certain terminology developed, you know, as in any field, any uh, specialization, the people who were involved in it developed certain terminology to describe the different processes which are taking place in that particular field. And in the field of hadith, uh, compilation, etc., there uh, was a variety of terms which evolved, which, though there are Arabic terms having their own meaning in the language, in the hadith context, they took on special meanings. Now, the first of these terms is known as sama'ah. Sama'ah. And sama'ah means literally in this context, it means listening. Actually, sama means listening. But in this context, the specialized context, it meant the reading of a teacher. The reading of a teacher. One who taught hadith, that he read the hadith. Meaning that the narrator of the hadith, either he recited it from his memory, right? Which was uh, in common use in the first uh, century, but by the second century, the middle of the second century, this method of teaching declined. Right? Because the process of writing hadith, you know, became far more widespread, the techniques, people learning it, etc., you know, more knew it. So as writing increased, then narration from memory decreased. However, this method still continued, you know, as a part of training for scholars in the memorization of hadith. This tradition of memorizing is still a part of the tradition of hadith study. So, for example, in the University of Medina today, if you join the College of Hadith, right, and you study all of the various uh, fields related to the science of hadith, you learn fiqh and these type of other things, tawheed, aqeedah, etc. along with it. 
At the same time, each student is required to memorize each year 250 hadiths. Means that by the time they graduate, they should have memorized 1,000 hadiths. And this is with the chain of narrators. This is not just saying, you know, Abu Bakr said. You know, <laughs> it, it is with the complete chain. And I mean, of course, this is all in books now. So technically speaking, one could ask, why bother? But the point is that this is part of the tradition of hadith studies, hadith learning, that uh, students were required to memorize the main hadiths. This was uh, part of their training because when you are involved in the process of teaching hadiths or research yourself, by having a body of the key and the main hadiths which are used already memorized, this facilitates the process of learning as well as teaching. Now, the second understanding or second method which, which was practiced under the same heading of Sama was reading from books. This was still called Sama. Sama listening or hearing. Who is, who is listening and hearing here? The students. The students are listening or hearing from the teacher. The teacher may narrate directly from his memory, which we just spoke about, or he may narrate from uh, books, his own books, where he has recorded hadiths from his teacher, right, or teachers, many teachers, whatever. He would write them up in the books and he would read from his own books. Right? And this was uh, the preferred method, you know, by the middle of the se second century onward, this was the favorite method of teaching hadith, right? And the reading that he did, that book which we said was his own book, it might be literally the book which he wrote himself, or it might be a student's book which had been copied from his own book, right? Uh, either containing the complete book of his, his, his own compilation manuscripts, or selections from his manuscripts. The third method, uh, which also comes under Sama, is called question and answers. Question and answers. That is, uh, actually this was a method used for testing the teachers. You know, and what, what would happen is that the students would recite a part of the hadith and the teacher would complete the remainder. Right? Uh, it was a mode which was used to test some of the scholars, some of the leading scholars of hadith, test their abilities, their memories, etc. The fourth method, which also comes under Samar, is the dictation method. Dictation. That is, <coughs> where uh, actually this process of dictation began with the Sahaba, one of the companions by the name of Watila ibn Aqsa. Uh, he was the first to actually hold classes for the dictation of hadith. In the early generation, in the generation of the Sahaba, uh, it was not so much encouraged because it was seen as a very easy way for people to pick up huge amounts of knowledge in a very short space of time. And they felt, the scholars, the early scholars felt that, you know, unless there was an effort on the part of the students, then they would treat that knowledge very lightly. You know, and this is uh, a common experience that when things come easy, you know, people don't give it the same value as when they have to struggle and to strive to get it. So you find that um, the early uh, scholars amongst the Sahaba didn't like to use this method in terms of uh, teaching. Now, later on, however, uh, by the middle of the second century, this became a popular method. As Zuhri, who was the same one who was asked by Caliph Omar ibn Abdul Aziz to begin the process of compiling the books of Hadith, uh, he started to use this method and continues to do so for the rest of his life. And uh, the dictation was either from memory 
or from books, both ways. What would happen is that a fast writer from amongst the students would do the writing and uh, another uh, student or other students would observe his writing to make sure he didn't make any mistakes and they would borry, borrow his uh, copy after the lesson and then make their own copies. Right? Now, what, one may question, well, what's the difference between this and the teacher reading from his, uh, his own books? Isn't this not the same thing? Well, the difference is that in this case, the reading was a continuous reading. In the other case, when they were reading from the book, dictation, different, I mean, uh, from when you say something, you're explaining each uh, aspect of it, you explain the hadith, you're explaining things concerning the hadith, the narrators, you know, so for a full presentation. Whereas dictation, you're just reading from a text. Okay. The second uh, method of transmission was known as Ard. Ard. And Ard comes from the Arabic word Arada, which means to expose or to show. And what this referred to in the technical language of the scholars was the reading of the students. Instead of the reading of the teacher, we now have the reading of the students. The students would read the teacher's book to him, while other students compared the hadith that they were reading to what they had in their own collections. And from the middle, uh, or for really from the beginning of the second century, this became one of the most popular methods of learning. And you find it in practice even till today. If you go in certain areas where they still for, use the traditional methods of the circles of learning. If you go to uh, the, the masjid in Medina, in Mecca, you know, some of the old masjids in Egypt and elsewhere, you will find, you know, a leading scholar will be there and a student will be reading from a book. He will stop the student, give explanations, added explanations, etc., etc. But then, you know, the student will continue. He's the one who does the reading. The books that they were reading from, of course, were the books of the teacher. Either the teacher provided copies, because many of the teachers would have scribes along with them who were personal students who would stay and make copies of these books, or there were copies made by the students from the original copy of the teacher, and whenever they made a copy, what they would do is at the end of each hadith, for example, the hadith ends, uh, you have a hadith which begins, for example, haddathana, and they go on, go on, go on, to the end, uh, uh, whatever, faqat. That's the end of the hadith. What they would do is they would write or make a circle above the end of the hadith. And every time they read the hadith back to the teacher, they would make a mark in here, you know. What we would normally put a tick, they would make some kind of mark inside of that circle. And that, it would not be permissible for them to narrate hadith from this book until it at least have gone through one reading to the teacher wherein he has approved all of the hadiths. Right? Of course, these books were oftentimes read many more than one time. And each time the student would read it, they would go and put another mark in that circle. Now, this was in the case of the copy books of the students themselves. Of course, the teacher's own book, I mean, this was not necessary. But wherever copies were made, this was necessary. And um, basically, a student who got a hold of copies, even of his own teacher, right, but didn't go through this process, and he began to narrate from books, he was classified as Sadiq al-Hadith, or a Hadith thief. You know, they would label him as a Hadith thief if he did this. And this is sort of equivalent to, you know, modern day copyright laws, you know, where 
you know, a person may buy as many copies of a book as they want, but to produce your own book, you cannot without permission of the author himself, right? Or the company that handles the book for him, okay? So these were the most popular two methods of transmission, Sama' and Arv. The third, called Ijaza, this was a permit to transmit, a permission given to students to transmit the information which they had received, the hadith. And this was given obviously by the teacher to the student. After the student has had read the book back to the teacher, then the teacher uh, would give him permission. Now, this permission in later centuries became just a permission to read. They had read through the hadith. Many times the hadith would not have all of the fatha, kasra, dhammas, these kind of things. So it meant they had to have knowledge of the language, knowledge of the words, etc. to be able to read it back accurately. So that permit was a permit of reading. In earlier times, that permit was a permit of reading with understanding, being able to give, uh, you know, explanation of the uh, strange words in the, in the hadith. There may be some unusual words used, you know, which are not in common usage at that time that the teacher would have explained. The students would also have to be able to do that. Having done that, they would get their ijaza, right? And um, this ijaza, actually, the tradition continued down for a number of centuries to the uh, oldest uh, Masjid in, in North Africa, uh, which was um, known as the Kairawan Masjid, uh, there they used to write when they gave the student the ijaza, right? They would write at the bottom of it, Bilhaq ar riwaya, meaning you have the right to narrate. Haq meaning right, riwaya means narration or transmission. So, bilhaq ar riwaya. This was the phrase placed at the bottom of these ijaza certificates. And when Muslims, you know, uh, of course Muslims also ruled Spain, and this tradition was practiced there also, carried into Spain, and this was the, uh, uh, the way in which these certificates were signed. Bilhaq ar riwaya eventually became corrupted into baccalaureate. And from baccalaureate, it became bachelor's. So what we now know as the bachelor's degree, the BA, it comes from this phrase, bilhaq ar riwaya which was placed on the bottom of the ijaza certificates. Anyway, um, the, the use of this, basically, was to protect uh, text from alteration, you know, this issue of uh, getting permission to transmit, this was to protect the texts from additions or subtractions which were taking place, uh, which may, you know, students may have made their own notes, etc., in a, a given text from the teacher. The teacher would only give a permit if he read back the text as it was, and they would sign it and then would indicate there that nothing else could be added to it. Right? So this was a way of preserving texts from alteration. The fourth uh, method is known as uh, munawala. Right? Munawala. Uh, munawala comes from a term which means to, to take or to, to pick up or and what it refers to is the granting of books. That is, a teacher may grant or give uh, a student of his, his book with the authority to transmit it. Either one of the copies which were made by his scribes, right? he would grant that to the student, and the student was given permission to transmit it. You know, it may have been one of his students that had been with him from the beginning. And so he didn't need to have him read it back to him and then verify his reading. He was known. So it was just simply the act of giving him that book 
and giving him the permit to transmit it. And um, there were scholars like Az-Zuhri, for example, who practiced this. He gave several manuscripts of his collection to some of the leading scholars of his time, Al-Thawri, Al-Awza'i, and Ubaidullah ibn Umar. You know, they had received copies. I mean, this was uh, done by a few scholars. It wasn't really a widespread practice. The next method, uh, the fifth method, is called Kitaba. And in modern terms, we may re refer to it as correspondence. This is where a teacher would write down hadiths and send them to a student who was then given permission to narrate these hadiths. And it is something like what we may call, you know, learning by correspondence you know, today, or distance learning. This is a, a similar method. And this existed actually from the first century. Because when the caliphs like Omar uh, radiallahu anhu sent out letters to the governors and, and, and uh, rulers in different provinces, these letters would be filled with hadiths, instructing them to do this, do the other. Whatever he's instructing them, he's going to mention some hadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu to support it. And these letters were uh, then, in turn, read back. People learned the hadith and they taught it to others. Of course, the, the letter would have the stamp or the signature of Omar on it, which is what validated it, right? And um, this, as I said, mode of, of learning and, and transmission you know, existed right from the very first century. Uh, the sixth method is known as I'lam. I'lam. And A'lama means to announce. And what is uh, meant here is when a teacher would inform students, he has a book that he is going to narrate from, but it's not his own book, right? It's not his own co compilation. He has a compilation, which is the compilation of another teacher, and he informs his students that he already has permission from that uh, teacher, the, the author of the original book which he's reading from, he had permission to transmit it. He's just informing them, confirming that he has that permission. But for them, for them, the students, to be able to narrate, they could not merely write down whatever they heard from him and narrate it. They would have to go back and get an original copy which had the permit given by the original author mentioning their teacher's name in it you know before they had to see that with their own eyes before they were permitted to narrate and just the statement of the teacher was not enough if he's narrating his own material that's one thing but if he's narrating somebody else's material he informs them but before and they can record but before they can narrate what they have recorded they must confirm uh, with their own eyes that the permit was in fact given. The seventh method called wasiya. This method uh, basically was on the deathbed of a teacher. He would bequest or bequeath his books to one of his leading students. And when he does, when he does so, I mean, and this was the practice of all the most of the leading scholars, whenever the time came for them to die, then they would turn the books over either to their sons or daughters who had themselves risen in the ranks and had become leading scholars, or to their leading students. Right? And of course, in doing so, they gave them permits to narrate from these books. The last method is known as wajada, and wajada is basically basically means discovery, means discovery of books, meaning that uh, somebody, for example, a student of a teacher, um, after the teacher dies or something like this, or he goes to another land and he finds a book which contains narrations from his teacher, for example. This occurred because books travel to different lands, etc. But it was not considered a valid way of learning. 
in the days of the transmission of hadith. I mean, today, that's what we do all the time. We go to a store and we buy a book. Right? That's just like finding it. We didn't learn it from the, the person who wrote the book. You know? This is the common method today. But in those days, they did not accept this as a legitimate means of learning. To say, I just found a book, I learned the hadith, and I'm going to go and teach it. No. You had to have had that, th these narrations uh, confirmed from a teacher. You, you, you recited it before him, he confirmed they're authentic, you knew what it meant, and then you could narrate. These represent the main eight methods of narration or transmission of hadith. Of course, one and two were the most common. Right? Right? This is the sama and al. Either the teacher is narrating and dictating, or the student is reading from the books of the teacher. Now, in terms of the terminology which was used in the process of narration. <coughs> the scholars, as they de develop technical language to describe the modes by which they learned, they also developed technical language or technical terms in their uh, manuscripts to indicate the conveyance of the information. <coughs> and it's important to understand the technical meanings of these terms because in the misunderstanding of the technical meanings uh, we find a misunderstanding uh, concerning the actual uh, transmission of hadith. Now the first term most commonly used and it's the first two first term is called haddathana it's like this one which I wrote here haddathana right which literally means he said to us haddathana or he told us he related to us haddathana commonly when they're writing hadith because it's a big word haddathana it involves one, two, three, four, five letters and when you're writing hadith you want to uh, write it as quickly as possible and this is just a connecting term so they developed a shorthand version and they would just write Thana, just the Tha, Noon, Alif, Thana, which meant Haddathana. Or they would write instead just Na, you know, this was like shorthand, right? They would write Na. Now, this term Haddathana was used basically to indicate the first method of transmission. That is, either from memory, or the more popular method, reading from, the teacher reading from his books. Either the teacher reading from, or reciting, or orally dictating from his memory, or he is reading from his books. And reading from the books, as I said, became the most popular method by the second century onwards. So, haddathana, though literally it means he said to us, what it actually meant, is he said to us or he read to us and most commonly it meant he read to us the second term used is akhbarana from khabar khabar means information akhbarana he informed us akhbarana a number of scholars used haddathana and akhbarana interchangeably but the majority of scholars, hadith scholars, they use akhbarana to refer to the second method of teaching. That is, where students read the books or copies of the books of the teachers. Akhbarana, which though literally meant he informed us, it technically meant the students read from books the hadith of the teacher and he confirmed it. The teacher, the teacher, had 
Bethana, he informed us, meaning our teacher informed us. The third is Amba'ana. Right? Amba'a means again to inform. Surah an naba news, right? It comes from the same Arabic verb, Amba'a, comes from the same root, naba. Amba'ana means he informed us. But actually, this term was used specifically to indicate the third and fourth methods, ijaza and munawala. Whenever, you know, books were given with the permission to narrate, this, the, when the, 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 the scholars or the students who narrated it, they would say, Amba'ana. And it was understood among the scholars or the students that it meant they received the book which they had heard and had permission to transmit it. So they were still reading from books. The fourth method is Sami'a. Sami'a is the verb to hear. Right? To hear. And they would say, for example, Sami'atu. I heard from so and so. And this was strictly used for the first, first method. The student is describing hearing himself, not reading himself, but hearing from the teacher directly. So these four methods, in particular, Haddathana, Barana, Ba'ana, and Samir, these indicate direct uh, transmission of information. And they were the strongest terms, actually, Haddathana, Barana, and Samia. The fifth method, known as An, which meant from, this conjunction was used, or preposition was used, to refer to all of the previous methods. An. When the hadith uses An, and you find it throughout the text, and it's sort of vague. You didn't know whether it was reading, reading of the teacher, reading of the student, whether they received it by hand, granted to them, whatever. It was just an. This was a phrase which was used in the uh, text which were written. And it was considered to be an inferior mode. In fact, when we look at the classification of hadith later, we'll see that it was the cause of uh, making or labeling a hadith as da'if, being weak, the use of this phrase. But not in all cases, in specific cases. So, what we're saying here, that of the eight methods of uh, narration or transmission, seven out of the eight were specifically reading from texts. The one, number one, meant either reading from a text or reciting from memory. So in other words, the majority of methods by which the hadiths were narrated among the scholars was through reading from writings. which may come as a surprise to many you know, who were familiar with the uh, phrases haddathana, thinking, and akbarana, that it was all oral narration. And those who were trying to argue this point, they do bring this forward, they use this as evidence that in fact the hadiths were narrated orally. But in fact, as we said, uh, evidence proves otherwise. Now, in terms of those who attended the Hadith circles, what happened was the scholars and they would have sort of main students who were around them who would write for them or read for them. Uh, at the end of each session, 
a record of attendance was kept. They would write the names of those who attended. Uh, they also used to write the ages of those who attended. And they used to write whether the people attended the full reading of the text or whether they attended only a partial reading of the text. Meaning, meaning that usually the reading of a text is going to take some time. It may not be at the end of each session. Right? Individual students may have made their marks. Right? But at the end of the completion of the reading of a book, right, then all of this information will be gathered. At the end of each session, nightly, the students of the teacher may make also these notations. So, a body of biographical information was now being transmitted along with the hadiths. Information about those people who were attending, studying, writing, narrating. If a student was under the age of five, they would mention his name, but they would just write, Hadab, he attended. If he was over the age of five, they would write that he was a student. They classified after the age of five as being a student. Younger than the age of five, they would just classify them as just an attendee, right? You know, it's like um, auditing a course, right? You're just auditing, right? Um, the certificate that we mentioned, you know, at the end, were a book had on it all of the people who attended and all this kind of information. This was, uh, I said, included a statement that nothing else should be added to the text, you know, indicating nothing else would be added, and it would be in the handwriting of that particular teacher. This was called tiba. Uh, this uh, stipulation which they would put at the end was called tiba, And they would uh, put this, you know, as I said, at the end of uh, the reading of any of the major texts. Now, during the era of the Tabi'un, who were the students of the Sahaba, right, those who were going to study Hadith, they would first memorize the whole Quran. This was the norm. They would first go and memorize the whole Quran, and they would go and study Islamic law, Sharia, under some fit teachers and they would go and study Arabic grammar and after that they would join the circles of Hadith usually the average age was around 20 that they would join the study of Hadith however there were some who learned earlier as Zuhri had mentioned Ibn Uyayna who was 15 years old at the time to have been the youngest student he had seen in the circles but Ahmed Ibn Hanbal he had be begun the study of a hadith when he was himself 16 years old. Now, later on, when the texts were fixed, right, standard texts and compilation like al muwatta and the Musannafat and so on and so had become standardized, then they would accept uh, even much younger people, young kids, you know, somebody going to study might even bring his son or whatever uh, along with him or daughter along with them. You know, and this is where you found people down to the age now of five and they would make record of these people. And the basic position that the scholars took is that the, uh, the youngest age was the age at which the child could discriminate between a cow and a donkey. You know, this is how they put it, right? If, the, if you pointed to a donkey and they would know this was a donkey and this wasn't a cow, they, you know, course, the certain age kids would mix up this is a cow and a donkey, you know. So, uh, that when they reached the point where they really knew what a cow was and what a donkey was, they said, okay, this is the time that they could now start uh, officially learning hadith. So we find, for example, at Dabari, who transmitted the Musannaf of Abdul Razak, uh, after Abdul Razak died, he was only seven years old, you know, and he was the main transmitter of this uh, work, al Musanna. Now, what you found <coughs> is that 
with every generation, the numbers of teachers and students increased exponentially. In the time of the Tabi'un, scholars like Al-Thawri, Ibn al-Mubarak, and al-Zuhri made reference to hundreds of their own teachers. They had studied under hundreds of teachers. And Al-Zuhri himself has over 50 recorded students. Now he had many others who sat in his classes uh, who were not on record as having been his, uh, among his main students. But he had over 50 students who would be classified as main students who narrated books from him. And of course, their students had similar type of numbers and even bigger. So what you find is that with each generation, the numbers of uh, transmissions of the hadiths became many. So a single hadith, for example, which was narrated by a Sahabi to a group of Tabi'is, and they narrated this to a, an even larger group, each one of them to an even larger group of Tabi'i Tabi'is. Right? That single hadith, what began as a single hadith, by the time it reached the Tabi'i Tabi'is were narrating, maybe up to a hundred different narrations of that same hadith. By the time it reached the Tabi'i Tabi'is. And it was the practice of the scholars in that time to refer to every channel of narration as a hadith. And this is why, remember I mentioned to you, that it is commonly said that, I recorded, that the number of hadiths which were narrated by Abu Huraira was some 5,700 plus hadiths. Whereas, when you check the actual number of hadiths which he narrated, it's really only 1,200 and something, sorry. And it, it dropped down drastically. Some 43% really of the actual number which was attributed to him. Why that was? Because they referred to every channel in which a hadith came from Abu Huraira as being a hadith from Abu Huraira. This is where you got that big number. And this is why people sort of raise doubt. They, usually when people are trying to attack hadith, they usually head straight for Abu Huraira because he was the most prolific narrator of hadith. And he was really only with Prophet for three years. You know? He was only with him for three years, then he was sent as a governor. Right? So he spent three years with the Prophet So they questioned, how in the world could he, spending three years with Prophet Sallallahu be narrating 5,000 hadith? The point is that the actual numbers were 1,000 plus. Furthermore, the, uh, he, as he explained, when everybody else was, you know, busy with work, you know, with their farms or whatever, uh, and their businesses, etc., he said, I used to just sit and memorize the hadith of the Prophet. That's all I did. And on one occasion, I complained to Prophet that, you know, I was having trouble remembering some of the hadith. And he put his cloak over me, his cloak, put it over me. And from then on, he said, didn't forget the hadith. So when we deal with the fact that we, we talk about only 1,000 uh, plus hadith, 1,500, 600 hadith, you know, this in the terms in terms of living with a person for th three years, right? And he stuck very close to problems and like them. To find 1,600 things that you could describe about this person or what they said, it's not that. Now, as an example of the proliferation of Isnads, there is a hadith, very famous hadith, uh, wherein the Prophet Sallallahu had said, إِنَّمَا جُعِلَ الْإِمَامُ لِيُعْتَمَّ بِي Indeed, the Imam was appointed to be followed. So when he says, Allahu Akbar, Say, all of you, Allahu Akbar. And don't say it until he has said it. And when he bows, all of you should bow. But do not bow until he bows. 
When he says, Sami Allah liman hamida, that is Allah hears those who praise him, then say, Allahumma Rabbana lakal hamd. O oh Allah, our Lord, all praise is yours. And when he prostrates, do so, but don't do so before he does so. And if he prays standing, then do so. And if he prays sitting, you all should pray sitting. This is a thing I think a lot of people don't know. If the Imam, for whatever reason, is ill, crippled, or whatever, he prays sitting, then everybody behind him is supposed to pray sitting also. And they get the reward of praying standing. True, Prophet said the prayer sitting is worth half the prayer standing. The prayer lying is worth half the prayer sitting. Right? So we know that for a person to pray nafila, sitting, is to chop off half the reward of their prayer straight away. And this is a practice common in the Hanafi school. Of the nawafil, they, if you wanted some of the nawafil, they pray sitting. But in fact, they are just throwing away half the reward of their prayer. The Prophet ﷺ clearly says that. They say, well, no, we're following the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. What sunnah? The sunnah when he was too sick to stand, he could no longer stand, so he prayed sitting. That's the sunnah you're following? No, you're not. You're not following it because you're not sick. Right? If you were sick and you prayed sitting, then you're following his sunnah. But if you are perfectly healthy and you're praying sitting, when he prayed sitting when he was sick, then you're not following the sunnah. That's the reality. Anyway, this hadith, when you look at the uh, narration of this hadith, what you find is that it was transmitted from the Prophet ﷺ by ten companions living in three different locations. Some were in Mecca, some were in Syria, and some were in Iraq. Right? Of the ten companions who narrated this hadith, one of them, Abu Huraira, had seven students who transmitted the hadith from him. Four of them lived in Medina, two in Egypt, and one in Yemen. These seven students, in turn, transmitted to twelve other students. Five in Medina, two in Mecca, one each in Syria, Kufa, Ta'if, Egypt, and Yemen. Right? And the total number of those who narrated, third generation authorities who uh, reported this hadith, collected the hadith, they were some 26. It started with the Prophet and it ended up being collected by 26 different narrators in 10 different locations, in Medina, Mecca, Egypt, Hems, uh, Yemen, Kufa, Syria, Wasit, and Taif. So what you can see is, that these narrations spread over the Muslim world. This is the dissemination of knowledge now. And when you go back and you look at the various channels through which the hadith was transmitted, you find that they were transmitted in virtually the same wording everywhere that it was uh, transmitted to. Okay. Um, Just uh, to complete this section, there is, we're going to take a pause after that. To complete this section, there is one other point. Oh, can you slow down a bit so we can write this down? Well, uh, these details, don't worry too much about these details, right? What you can catch with shorthand, you catch. What you can't, as I said, I am preparing the notes, you know. By tomorrow, inshallah or Tuesday at the latest. <laughs> I will have it in your head. The important point is, I mean, you hear and understand basically what I'm presenting, hear the ideas. You have it in your hand when you do revision because inshallah we'll have the examination on Saturday, right? So you'll have it to revise with over the weekend, right? Anyway, the final point which has to do with the transmission of hadith which I'd like to address now is the system of Isnad. This 
these different ch channels of narration, this is referred to as isnad of the hadith. Right? The chain of narration of the hadith, the isnad. Now, <clears throat> some people mistakenly think that it is unique to Muslims. That it doesn't exist anywhere else. In fact, it isn't. It did exist elsewhere. Orientalists, you know, because the fact that Isnad took on a very, very important point, position in Islam, so much so that it was elevated to be a part of the religion. Ibn al-Mubarak, Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, had said, and he was one of the scholars from the second century, he had said, and he was one of the teachers of Imam al-Bukhari, right? Imam Bukhari is one of his teachers, he said, the Isnad is from the religion. Were it not for the Isnad, anyone could say anything he wished. The Isnad is from the religion, it's a part of the religion. Were it not for the Isnad, anyone could say anything he wished about the religion. He could add, subtract anything he wanted. And by the end of the first century, the Isnad science was fully de developed. Ibn Sirin, who was one of the people who died at the end of the first century, he had said, <clears throat> in the beginning, they would not ask about Isnad all the time. They were not particular about the Isnad. However, once the fitna took place, turmoil spread, then they began to demand it. The fitna is understood to refer to this, the struggle between Ali and Muawiyah, and to some degree to the time of Uthman, and this, the turmoil which developed after it. Uh, from that period, means from amongst the Sahaba, from the time of the Sahaba, they started to question. Now, whenever people were bringing information, they started to demand. They were saying, name your men to us, name your narrators to us. And if the narrators mentioned were from Ahlul Sunnah, we accepted. And if they were from Ahlul Bid'ah, we rejected. And because during the time of turmoil, you know, people tried to introduce statements or concepts into support uh, their various deviations, with certain deviations taking place. <coughs> anyway, as I said, the Isnad ha has a critical role with regards to Islam. So naturally, the Orientalists, try to downplay the importance of Isnad. Orientalists mean uh, scholars, uh, Western scholars, non-Muslims, who have spent a great deal of time to learn Arabic and to study Arabic texts and this type of thing. Some of them become specialists in these texts. Right? But their sole goal, on one hand, it is the pride of being you know, an Arabist a scholar. And on the other hand, it is, and it began, as a means of finding the weak points amongst Muslims to facilitate the attack, the intellectual attack on Islam. Right? This developed out of centers of learning for the, or for the missionaries, actually. Some of the big universities like McGill University in Canada and others, they were centers for, or, uh, for missionaries where they would learn Arabic, they would prepare themselves, study the weakness in the Muslim uh, concepts where they perceive weaknesses and they would use this as a means to attack. Anyway, one of the Jewish professors, George Horowitz, he brought evidence from the Mishnah and other books of ancient books of the Jews to show that in fact they did have a Islamic system that existed amongst the Jews before the Arabs. And uh, he went on to try to trace it back to the Mosaic period, in the time of Moses. And in the Talmud, uh, you find huge chains of narrations relating all the way back to the Mosaic period. However, his arguments of trying to trace it back to the Mosaic period is doubtful, you know, because there's no way of proving that these were not later interpolations. But that they did exist among the Jews in their literature before the time of Islam, there's no doubt about it. Furthermore, it can be found in Indian literature. Even before this, uh, you can find it in some of the ancient Hindu texts, in Buddhist texts, and in Jain literature. In one of the great epics known as Mahabharata, 
right? Or Bhakta, Mahabhakta. It states, uh, Vaisda composed it, Ganesha served as a scribe, and the work was handed down to Vaisam Payana, who com communicated to the king uh, Janami Jaya. And uh, Sauti, who was present at the time, heard it and narrated it uh, to the assembly of sages. This is within the temple. So they have narration. However, the fact that it originated elsewhere is not really important. What is important is that Muslims took this and elevated it, developed it, and evolved it to a point which was incomparable to uh, Isnad anywhere else. They added to it chronological information. They assembled biographies about the narrators, transmitters, and they established a science to determine the value of the contents as well as the authenticity of the channels of narration. This you cannot find anywhere else. The ancient Hindus, Indians, sorry, Hindus, uh, they made no rigorous attempt uh, 